Good Erev Shabbat. I hope you're managing well. I miss you and I look forward to seeing you soon. The plague preceding Lagba Omer struck thousands of Rabbi Kiva students around 1900 years ago. Tradition has it, as recorded by the Ramah, that the students stopped dying on Lagba Omer, making it a day of relief and renewal for all time. And like their salvation from the plague, we hope and pray that Lagba Omer this year be a harbinger of salvation for us too from our modern day plague. Every year, thousands of Israelis flock north to Meiron, the burial site of Rav Shem Yochai, because Lag Bomer is his yurt site. And due to the health crisis this year, Israel is limiting visitors and prohibiting banning all private bonfires. But Israel announced yesterday, and this is true, that three bonfires will be allowed to be lit in Meiron. There will be one for Ashkenazim, one for Svardim, and one for the religious Zionist Datilumi community. Gosh, we can't even agree on what kind of fire to have in honor of Rav Shem Bayochai. And this seems to be contrary to what Lag Bomer is all about because the rabbis suggested that our suffering was due to our inability to show respect to one another. Rav Shem Bayochai and the next generation of Rabbi Kiva students learn the lesson, and we too, especially at this time, need to finally come together in unity. During the Omer, so as you know, we have morning restrictions to memorialize the pogroms of the Crusades in 1096, which decimated the Jewish communities of Spire, Vermeiza, and Magensa, all of which occurred during this time of Pesach and Shavuot. However, the classic reason by, given by the Gemara Yevamot is that our mourning is tied into the death of the students, Rabbi Akiva. 12,000 pairs, 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva died between Pesach and Shavuot. And the Gemara says that they died from the terrible death of Askara. How are we to understand this large number of 24,000? Certainly it's possible that Rabbi Kiva had 24,000 students, but it makes us wonder. And the second question is, what is the meaning of this death of Askara? It's an unusual word. And Rashi explains that it's an intestinal illness of some kind that plagued the students. But perhaps we can offer another approach. The word Sikra is the Latin word for sword or dagger. The Sikari were a group of extremists, zealots, who received their name because they would carry these daggers and attack people who held different views than their own. So we see that Sikra, Askara, means sword. And so based on Rabbi Yosef Elio Henkin and others, I'd like to suggest a theory, which is that the Talmidi Rabbi Akiva were killed by Sikari, which means that they were killed by the sword. The Talmud Yerushalmi says that Rabbi Akiva was the most prominent of the sages who supported Bar Kokhba's revolt against the Romans. Rabbi Kiva thought that Bar Kokhba was Mashiach, and he was the one who gave him that surname, Bar Kokhba, son of the star, clearly a messianic reference. And when the Talmud Yavamit records that 24,000 Talmidim of Rabbi Kiva died, perhaps Talmidim doesn't mean students who were learning directly with Rabbi Kiva, but perhaps there were followers of Rabbi Kiva who followed his call to join Bar Kokhba's rebellion. It's interesting, archeologists have found coins from the time of Bar Kokhba. On one side of the coin, it says, liberation of Yerushalayim, which is what they were fighting for. And on the other side, it has a picture of a lulav, an etrog, with one hadas, one myrtle branch. I mentioned this a couple of years ago in Sukkot, that the majority position that we follow is that we have three myrtle branches in the lulav. But, Perhaps there's only one myrtle branch on the coin of Bar Kokhba because that was the position recorded in the Mishnah of Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Akiva was the rabbi, was the posseik, so to speak, for Bar Kokhba. So it makes sense that on the coin representing Bar Kokhba's movement, they would have a picture of a lulav and etrog with one myrtle branch in accordance with Rabbi Akiva. And so the resistance began in the year 132 of the Kamen Era, around 60 years after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. They were successful for a few years, had significant gains, but after a brief span of glory, they suffered a terrible defeat. And so maybe the death of the followers of Akiva wasn't through a plague or intestinal illness, but they were killed by a sword in the battles against the Romans. The last battle was the massacre at Betar, and the massive losses, as suggested by the Gemara, took place during this period of time between Pesach and Shavuot. Rabbi Yosef Elio Henkin suggests this idea, and he says that perhaps the rabbis 
didn't write it explicitly in the Gemara, they didn't want to give the reason for, you know, and the reason what happened because of fear of reprisals. And understood in this way, Sfirat Omer gives us a whole new layer of appreciation to our modern national experience. Yom Asmut and Yom Yerushalayim celebrate events which are coming full circle from the events surrounding Rabbi Akiva's students. In Sfira, we reflect upon those Jews who fought passionately for independence from the Romans. They were unsuccessful and lost their lives, which causes us to mourn for all these centuries. But we mourn their loss of life, but also for the independence and national sovereignty, which we have lacked for so long. And then in 1948, with the miracle of Hakamat Medina, with Jewish heroism assisted by the divine providence, we reestablished sovereignty and independence. So 1900 years after Bar Kokhba, we were finally successful in achieving our dreams. Hayinu Kachomim. What the Bar Kokhba rebellion couldn't sustain and restore was finally accomplished in our generation. Our generation finished the job that they had begun. And particularly during our health crisis, we can tap into, I believe, the courage of previous generations and carry it forward. We can learn resilience from Bar Kokhba and his followers, from Rosh Hashanah who was also pursued by the Romans, who was also in quarantine in a cave for 13 years, but it managed to spark a revival of the Jewish people after the deaths of Rabbi Kiva's followers. We can learn resilience from all the generations of Jews who kept moving forward, who maintained their commitment to the highest ideals, even during difficult times. And our situation today cannot be compared to previous generations who faced far more difficult circumstances, far dire, far more dire. But we can learn resilience and hope from them and be strengthened by this sense of continuity of the Jewish people. What they fought for, we were able to complete. They were killed in their revolt against the Romans, fighting for independence. We were able to finally achieve independence and sovereignty in the 20th and now 21st century. And the continuity is what the counting of the Omer is all about because you can't miss a day. And so to every generation is another link in the chain. Yom HaTzmod and Yom Yishlaim are coming full circle. We begin to reverse the mourning of Sfirat Omer. And we still observe mourning because we're mourning the losses and we're only at the beginning of the blossoming of redemption and we have a far way to go. But if we appreciate the incredible continuity of the Jewish people, if we tap into the strength and resilience of all these previous generations, if we strengthen our kavod, our respect to one another, and realize that, you know what, maybe it's time that we can light one fire for the Jewish people and we can come together in unity and celebrate what brings us together as opposed to what separates us. And so if we could tap into this, then hopefully we can also merit the renewal of the Jewish people. Our avela should turn into simcha. Our challenge during this period of time should turn into blessing and geula, for all of Am Yisrael and the entire world. Shabbat Shalom.